applications need to store data, don't they? Imagine sending a request to an API, getting a 200 response back, and then going to get that information later and it wasn't actually there anymore. Imagine going into a bank and depositing some money, because people still do that nowadays in physical banks, really, honestly. And you deposit the money and you come back a couple of days later and the money wasn't actually there. Not a very useful bank, not a very useful web application. Data and persistence is fundamental to almost every application out there, or pretty much every application I've ever worked on, and I'm sure it'll be the same for many of you, has some kind of persistence layer. Software development and data storage and persistence and databases have become almost one and the same thing to worrying data is a fundamental thing to most applications. So what does that mean when you're building with Cloudflare? Up to now, you've built a web application, fantastic, but that web application isn't storing data anywhere. And whilst NoSQL is all the rage nowadays, and I love DynamoDB as much as the next person, it is not always the right tool for the job. Relational databases, them traditional things that we used to run on servers, are still valuable in the modern world of software development. And for many of the applications you are building, you won't need the scale that DynamoDB gives you. Most of us, if not all of us, are not working at Amazon.com scale. And that's what you're going to learn about in this video today. You're gonna to learn how you can use Cloudflare's D1 database service to add persistence to your web applications running inside Cloudflare workers. And you can do all of that in a completely serverless way. Paper use, serverless relational databases, sounds like a win to me, let's get into it. Okay, so let's talk about databases. Databases inside Cloudflare workers, and that is using the D1 database service. Now D1 is the serverless relational database service provided by Cloudflare. Under the hood, it is just SQL Lite which is really quite cool because you can do an awful lot of really cool and powerful things using something as simple as SQLite. So how does all of that work inside the Cloudflare ecosystem? And this is one of my favorite parts of building with Cloudflare because when you're connecting with any of the other Cloudflare services, whether that's databases, caches, queues, you use what's called a binding. So in your actual wrangler.toml file, you'll see I've got a binding here for D1 databases. My binding is called chat metadata. And then I've got the database ID and the database name of the database that I want to bind to. Now inside this same repo, there are instructions and also some Terraform code for actually deploying the database and the cache that you need for this code to work. So you've created the database beforehand. You've got a database ID from inside Cloudflare, and then you create a binding, and this binds your worker to the actual instance of the database. Where this gets really, really powerful is with the local developer experience. You open up a terminal window now and navigate into the root of the directory. And there's a whole bunch of scripts in a make file in the root of this directory, one of which is make dev backend. This is gonna start up the locally emulated version of your Cloudflare worker. And remember from the first video in the series, this uses the exact same runtime that your worker is going to use when it runs in production. So you know, so you can be reasonably confident that if it works on your machine, it's gonna work when you actually go and deploy it to production. Where this gets incredibly, incredibly powerful though, you'll notice when I've run this dev command, my application is now running on localhost 8787. You'll notice just above that is you've got this line here. Your worker has access to the following bindings, a durable object, a D1 database, and a JWT secret. So my, my application running locally knows that there are bindings that exist. What is actually happening though is that the worker that is running locally is bound to a database that is also running locally. So all of these other serverless services that exist around workers inside Cloudflare can also be emulated locally. So when you interact with localhost 8787, which I can do if I open up Cloudflare, send a post request to that endpoint, the user is registered successfully, you have got the response back in your terminal saying API 200 okay, that has actually executed against the local instance of the database. You've got this complete full suite of local development experience and you don't need to change a single thing, find the binding in your wrangler.toml 
the local emulated version automatically knows that the database is required as well. You can run locally and connect to the real version of your database. When you run that make dev backend command, what that is actually running under the hood is the Wrangler dev command from Wrangler. If you run that Wrangler dev command, but pass in the remote flag, that is then gonna go off and actually connect to the real version of your database. It's gonna run that. You're connecting to the remote instances of all your bindings, running that same code without dash dash remote, runs everything locally, connects to everything locally. Really, really powerful stuff. As far as your application code goes, if you go and have a look at the lib.rs, again, this is another one of the really cool things about Cloudflare. To get access to your actual database, you actually just use this environment parameter that's passed into your fetch function. So to access your D1 database binding, you'll see all I'm doing is using my env parameter. I'm accessing this D1 function and passing in the name of the binding that I want to access. Here, I want, here you want to access the chat metadata binding. If you remember, that matches exactly what's inside the wrangler.toml. This binding is called chat metadata. And this would allow you to have multiple databases defined inside the same worker if you so wished. Once you get access to that D1 database, that returns a result. So you need to just handle the error in case that binding doesn't exist. What you'll actually get at the end of that is this D1 database struct. So to access all the resources that are integrated with your worker, it's just as simple as doing env. You'll see here I'm accessing a secret env. Secret. Here's the name of the secret I want to access and then you're off and running and you can use that. And once you've got that database binding, in this instance, I'm actually using a repository pattern. So you're accessing that database binding and passing that into your chat repository and your user repository. So if you go and have a look at the users.rs file now, this is where you can see the actual user repository. The user repository struct has a single property, which is the D1 database. And then you've actually got all of your data access code in one place. And you'll notice here, you're just using SQL. The DB, the D1 database struct has a parameter that is called, has a function called prepare. You can use the prepare function to actually define the SQL that you actually want to execute. You can use the bind function to bind parameters to your SQL code. So you'll see here, you're running an insert statement into the user's table and you're passing in two parameters as the values, and then you're binding the username and the user's password hash into them val values. And then you can execute the run command to actually go and run that code against your database. This is much of that working with any SQL database inside the Rust ecosystem. You define your SQL query, you bind your parameters, you execute the query. It is just SQL light, and you access it just using what is in essence an environment variable. Really, really powerful stuff coupled with that local development experience. You can just start things up locally and you are off and running. The other thing that's built into the Wrangler CLI is a whole bunch of CLI commands for interacting with your actual database. So if you actually go to your CLI and do npx Wrangler D1 and then pass in the help flag, you can see that you've got code to list D1 databases, to create databases, delete databases. Really importantly though, you've got this migrations option down at the bottom. So if I again do npx Wrangler D1 migrations, dash dash help, you get CLI commands for actually applying database migrations to your databases. You've got lists, you've got create, and you've got apply. If you run the create command in your CLI, that will create you a brand new database migration underneath your migrations folder. You'll see that there's already a few in this code base as this application has been developed over time. A user's table was added, different columns were added, different columns were removed. These database migrations have been created over time. You can then run npx wrangler d1 migrations apply. You need to pass in the name of the database you want to apply to. And then again, you've got this dash dash remote flag. So if you were to run the CLI command without dash dash remote, that is going to apply all of the migrations to your local instance of your d1 database. So if you execute that command, for me, there's one migration that hasn't been applied to this database. That's then going to be applied and my local instance of the database is now up to grit, is now up to date. If you run that same command with the dash dash remote flag, if you do that with the dash dash remote flag, you'll see this migration is now going to be applied to my remote database. That's going to go off and do that remotely. 
and now my production database is also up to date. Please, kids, don't do this at home. Don't just blindly update production databases from your CLI. This is mainly just me just giving you an example of how exactly that can work. So you've got the ability to query your database. You bind your database to your worker using a Wrangler, using your Wrangler.toml file. You access it using what is in essence an environment variable. There's a couple of other really cool features of D1 databases though. And one of them is actually one of the challenges that Cloudflare have discussed at length in one of their blog posts about building D1 databases. Because Cloudflare workers themselves inherently run as close as possible to the user. That is kind of the point in Cloudflare. The, your region is the entire globe. Wherever, the, wherever your users are in the world, your code is going to run as close as possible to them users. It's one of the beauties of Cloudflare. However, when you think about databases, doing having a database that is globally distributed across the entire globe in every possible data center is a really difficult thing to do. One of the things that Cloudflare do to help support that is a feature of workers called smart placement. So if you go and have a look at the wrangler.toml file, you'll see that there's this section in the toml file called placement. And here you're setting the placement mode to be smart. What does smart placement do? This was one of the most impressive things I discovered as I started learning about Cloudflare. When smart placement is enabled, behind the scenes, Cloudflare are going to work out where the best place to run your code is. So imagine you've got a database that you're connecting to and that database is somewhere in Europe. Let's say it's in Frankfurt for argument's sake. And your users are located in Australia. You've got a subset of users at the other side of the world. What smart placement is going to do is automatically behind the scenes work out is your code better being executed in a worker in Australia and then going across the internet to pull the data from the database in Frankfurt or is your worker always better running in the data center in Frankfurt and the user traffic traverses the internet from Australia. That is all gonna happen automatically behind the scenes without you doing anything. All you need to do is set placement mode to smart. Cloudflare is going to figure out for you where the best place to run your application code is. This is one of the truest definitions of serverless in my view. As a developer of a serverless application, I shouldn't have to worry about where my code runs. I shouldn't have to worry about my region. I should write my code and let the cloud provider work out the best place to run that code. This actually does that. Cloudflare have thought about that. Even if you're not connecting to a Cloudflare service, maybe you're connecting from your Cloudflare application to a DynamoDB database smart placement will still work in that instance. Cloudflare are going to work out where is the best place to run your worker. Super, super cool technology. And it's one of the things that really help this globally distributed database work. The one final feature of D1 databases I just want to touch on is a feature called time travel. Now with time travel, time travel allows you to restore your D1 database to any minute within the last 30 days you accidentally run that delete from query and forget to specify a where statement, that's okay because you can go back to the exact minute just before you ran that code and roll your database back. This is a really cool article on the Cloudflare blog that I'll put in the description below. That what happens with time travel is that they use a write ahead log in SQLite to actually allow the restoration of your database to any point within the last 30 days to a minute granularity. Very, very cool feature. And that is just built in. So that is all there is to data access and persistence for your Cloudflare applications. Remember, you need to create your database beforehand and you define a binding in your Wrangler.toml file. In your actual application code then, you can just access that binding using what is in essence an environment variable you call m.d1, pass in the name of your binding, you can then access that and interact with your database. And if you run this locally, you will get a fully featured local development experience that mirrors exactly how your code is gonna run when you deploy it to production. Really, really cool stuff, fully serverless databases. There's an incredibly generous free tier. I would really recommend going to check out D1 databases if you're starting to build with Cloudflare workers and you want a really high performance and fully serverless relational database. Thank you all for watching as always. I will see you all in the next video.